Dana Singh. It was a warm summer day in the community kitchen of the Gurudwara, and women were bustling about cleaning dishes, while a few stragglers finished their lunch. The sound of curtain from the hall of worship upstairs, was filtered blurrily into the room through an inadequate intercom, and the noise from a distant vacuum cleaner added to the cacophony. I was hot and tired after a series of problematic discussions. But Rajwinder, a Sikh with whom I was staying for a few days, wanted me to meet one more person. We were sitting cross-legged in one corner of the large hall, when a particularly gentle-looking man came and sat down with us, surrounded by a dense coterie of others. Some of them sat down with us and others remained standing, watching. Here is Bidana Singh, said Rajwinder. I looked at him questioningly. Was this the Dana Singh who was a member of the original Panthic Committee, which declared the independence of Khalistan in 1986? Rajwinder understood my wordless question and nodded slightly. Unprepared, I stammered out some phrases about how pleased I was to meet him, thinking as I spoke what questions I most urgently wanted to ask Dana Singh. But the conversation flew along without time to consider much what to say. Great is God, victory belongs to God. He began with the ritual greeting of the Khalsa Sikhs. Not sure where to start, I asked my usual introductory questions about family and background. I come from district Jalandhar, and the name of my village is Karar Majur. Here I was born and finished high school. After that for about a year I stayed home and worked in the fields. Of the four of us brothers, one is now in Canada, and the other two are still working on our family farm. As for me, after I worked in the fields for a while, I decided to go for a career in electric welding. But then the episode of 1978 happened, when the Narankaris attacked the Sikhs, and that was like a shock to my mind. Then I didn't feel like working in any field other than toward my faith. After that I was baptized into the Khalsa. Could you explain to me what is the process of being baptized? I asked. It was not really the point of what I wanted to know from Dana Singh, but it was an easy question for an anthropologist to fall back on. By Dana Singh looked slightly bemused by my question, but he explained patiently. In the morning on which a Sikh is to be baptized, he is to bathe completely, including washing of his hair. And then he has to have the five articles of faith on his body when he comes to the place where the baptism is to happen. Baptism is done in the presence of the Guru Granth Sahib, and in the presence of five beloved ones, the Panch Piaras, who are already there. All of them are wearing the five articles of faith. There we express our desire, standing before those five beloved ones, to be baptized. Then we are asked about certain principles and commitments which a Sikh has to have to be baptized. Those commitments have to be met, even if it comes to sacrificing oneself for the value of truth. Then the five beloved ones ask, are you ready for that, and when it is nodded yes, then the Sikh is baptized. In a bowl of iron, water, and some sugar crystals are stirred with the double-edged sword by the five beloved ones, one by one, and as they are stirring they are reciting a hymn. Then those five hymns which are recited during the baptism ceremony, become the prayer that the Sikh recites in the morning, afternoon, and night. After the Amrit is ready, the Sikh goes before the five beloved ones in a special posture, having his right knee on the ground, and one of the beloved ones takes the Amrit and gives him five drinks, puts the Amrit on his head five times, and sprinkles it on his eyes five times. All the time the seeker who is being baptized says, Wahi Guruji Ka Khalsa, Wahi Guruji Ki Fete, Khalsa belongs to God and victory belongs to God. After a Sikh is baptized, he is told that from now on, all Sikhs are brothers and sisters and there should not be any distinction on the basis of caste, color, or creed. You are all brothers and sisters, they say, and from now onwards you all belong to one father, Guru Gobind Singh, and you will all believe in one Almighty God, who is formless. Never worship any idols or anything else, never bow before graves or pseudo-saints. Guru Granth Sahib will be your holy guru. A Sikh must say his prayers every morning and evening. A Sikh is supposed to earn his bread through the sweat of his brow, 
and give one-tenth of his earnings to the needy and poor. Those are the ideals of Guru Nanak which are reinforced during the baptism ceremony, which reminds the Sikh that his duty is to obey them, throughout his life. What happened after you were baptized? I prompted. Well, after being baptized, I felt it was necessary that I should know the Guru Granth Sahib in its pure form, its grammar, and everything. So I joined Damdami Taksal. That is an institution which is considered to be a very pious, holy institution where all the meaning of the Guru Bani is taught in the true, ancient way. At Damdami Taksal, I was much impressed with Sant Jarnail Singh Ji Khalsa Bindranwala, who was the head of that place. I decided to stay with him permanently, I forgot about my home and all, and became convinced that we Sikhs were being treated as second-class citizens in India. The police used to raid Damdami Taksal and caught hold of us students, all very devout Sikhs, they humiliated us badly. They held us by our hair and took off our turbans, and threw cigarette butts on us. That was the worst kind of humiliation for devout Sikhs, and it was difficult to tolerate. I became convinced that until and unless we get freedom, we can't live as Sikhs with dignity and pride in this country. At Damdami Taksal, I learned that the religious places of the Hindus, like Rishikesh, Haridwar, and Banaras, were given the status of holy places. Buses were run on government basis for pilgrimage to these places. But when it came to our Golden Temple, the holiest of places for the Sikhs, curfews were applied, and Sikhs weren't even allowed to reach there sometimes. Even our preachers, very respectable people, even those who had nothing to do with any politics, they were stopped on the road, their swords taken off, and they were humiliated in the worst ways. Seeing this sort of thing was enough to convince me and the others at Damdami Taksal, that this was not the country for Sikhs. This was a Hindu country. One day one of the prominent Sikhs, Bhai Kulwant Singh Nagoke, was arrested. He was tortured very badly, and after hours and hours of that, he died. His body was completely mutilated. In July of 1982, three very devout Sikhs were arrested while on their way to see Sant Jarnail Singh Bindranwala. Two prominent lights of the Damdami Taksal, Baba Tara Singh Ji and Bhai Amrik Singh Ji, went to the police station to inquire why these religious people were arrested, and they also got arrested. It was feared they might get killed, as staged encounters had become common by this time. Sant Jarnail Singh Bindranwala set up headquarters in Guru Nanak Niwaz, a hostel in the Golden Temple complex, Amritsar. I moved slightly closer to him to push the tape recorder's microphone to a more opportune position. As I did it, three men nearby quite suddenly leaned in closer to Dana Singh. I realized how attentive everyone around us was, despite the noise and clutter going on in the rest of the hall. By Dana Singh continued in his soft voice. The first step taken by Sant Jarnail Singh Bindranwala, was to call for an agitation, in which we would raise our voices in a peaceful and democratic manner. So the first unit or Jathar of Sikhs, 51 Sikhs, went to court arrest on July 16. That was the first of the peaceful agitations called by Sant Jarnail Singh Bindranwala. Once Sant Jarnail Singh Bindranwala started the agitation, Akali Dal, the Sikh political organization, also gave their support. The majority of the Sikhs were by that time convinced that we were being discriminated against in this country. So the call of Sant Jarnail Singh Bindranwala was heard by Sikhs in their hearts, and they started to come forward to face any consequences, and to sacrifice themselves for justice. At that time, I interrupted, did you feel that you would be able to obtain justice within the Indian framework? I still wasn't sure whether he knew that I knew who he was. At that time our struggle was not for an independent Khalistan. The agitation was only for implementation of the Anand Per Sahib resolution, for greater autonomy. But even during that peaceful agitation, atrocities were committed by the government, and 183 Sikhs lost their lives. The families of those young people who participated were harassed too, their lands were destroyed and warnings were issued to their fellow villagers, that no one should look after their cattle. Sant Bindranwala kept saying, 
that we would continue to protest for the Anand Per Sahib resolution focused on the autonomy of the state. But if the Indian army touched the Golden Temple, then the foundation stone of Khalistan would be laid. That was what he said. Once the attack actually took place on June 3, 1984, and Sikhs saw what had happened not only to the Golden Temple, but to 37 other Sikh shrines, they made up their minds to go no more with Hindu India. Eventually we all got together at Amritsar to decide what to do. After we honored the families of those Sikhs killed during Operation Blue Star, we discussed what our plan of action should be. Since we have a historical tradition that things should be decided by five beloved ones, we thought of establishing a collective leadership under the command of five. I was one of those five. My name is Dana Singh Khalsa. So it was out in the open. I wondered whether his identity was well known outside of his immediate circle, outside of this Gurudwara. Did neighbors realize what a unique history this person had behind him? We five were given the responsibility by the Sarbat Khalsa, the Sikh Commonwealth, to lead the Sikh community, Dana Singh continued. The first thing we did was to restore the religious celebrations within the Gurudwara, that had been disrupted during the attack. The next task before us was, what political goal should be laid before the Sikhs? Well, that political goal had already been declared by Sant Jarnail Singh Bindranwala, when he had said that on the day that the Indian army would invade the Golden Temple, the foundation stone of Khalistan would be laid. So keeping that in mind, the five-member Panthic Committee declared an independent sovereign Khalistan as the only solution, on April 29, 1986. You have a copy of that declaration, Rajwinder added. I was intent on listening and barely noticed Rajwinder's continued presence. The next task before us was to help those families who were the victims of state repression. We went from village to village, identified them, and helped them in all ways. Then we started to recruit Sikhs from all places to help us in our goal. One thing about this declaration of April 29th, was that it was resolved that armed struggle was the only way that the Sikhs could achieve Khalistan. Though we are not against peaceful agitation, and peaceful strategies were not ruled out, on April 29th the armed struggle was given religious sanction through the Sarbat Khalsa. So we started to recruit people for that. At that time, were you convinced that all peaceful means had been exhausted, that armed struggle was the only recourse? I asked. This was a formulaic phrase for Sikhs, but it seemed a tactful way of establishing just when the militancy was given official sanction. I was already convinced through the history of what happened from 1947 to 1978, that we were being severely discriminated against. I personally witnessed, from 1978 to 1984, how we worked peacefully in all ways to achieve justice, but what we got in return was killing of our boys, our brothers, humiliation and molestation of our sisters, and finally the onslaught against the Golden Temple and 37 historical Sikh shrines. This left me convinced that all peaceful means were exhausted, and that now it was justified to take to the hilt of the sword. Armed struggle was not our choice, it was forced on us. Even in that declaration of April 29th, we appealed to all peace and justice-loving people in the world, to help us in getting liberated from the yoke of this tyrannical regime. We are the believers in Guru Nanak, we believe in working for the good of all, we believe in equality and justice. In that declaration we appealed to all other people to come and join us in our struggle. I helped in the armed part of the struggle, but don't want to disclose how, from April 29, 1986, to December 10, 1987. On December 10, 1987, I was taken out of a bus and arrested, probably on the word of some informant. At that time, were the other members of the Panthic Committee still alive and free? I asked. Yes, I was the first member of the Panthic Committee to be arrested, he responded. I was imprisoned for one year and humiliated during that year. Very derogatory comments were made about Sikhism. Sometimes cigarette butts were thrown in the food. They used to say, you foolish Sikhs, you are asking for Khalistan, here is your Khalistan. 
That was the kind of indignity I suffered for one year. After a 10-day police remand, I was sent to another jail, Nava Jail. The police started asking me for the names of other people involved in the movement, their whereabouts, and so on. I had been in jail for a whole year, so of course I didn't know anything about it, but they were torturing me and asking me to disclose information about various people. After six weeks in Nava, I was moved to Sangrur prison. In Sangrur I saw how badly the other political prisoners were treated. For months and months they were not allowed to meet with their ailing mothers and sick parents, even those who came to see them, and when relatives tried to come to visit, they were very badly abused by the jail authorities. My wife was allowed to visit me seven times during the whole year I had spent in jail. A usual police tactic is that whenever anybody is bonded out of jail, a big police force is standing outside the court. Then when the prisoner is released he is immediately arrested again, and charged with some other thing. But in the parliamentary elections of November 1989, nine members of parliament were elected who were either militants themselves, or family members of militants. That was how much support the freedom fighters had. So this time when my bond was accepted by the magistrate, a big number of Sikhs had gathered outside the court, and the police couldn't arrest me again. Did you feel that you had the support of most of the Sikhs at the time, even though there were some Sikhs who remained loyal to the central government? I asked. Of course, he would say yes, but I wanted to hear what else he would say. They may be Sikh in their appearance, he responded, but we never consider those people Sikhs. A Sikh is he who listens to the Guru's command, and Guru's command is to speak against injustice. Anybody who complies with an oppressive regime is never a Sikh. I had heard that kind of definition before. When I came out of jail, I tried to contact different freedom fighters. A lot of them had already been killed in fake encounters. Then, as there was a constant danger that I might be killed, I thought of leaving India to pursue the struggle from outside. Is the Panthic Committee able to effectively guide the struggle, now that one is here, one is there, some have been killed and replaced, and so on? I knew not much would be said about this, but I wanted to bring the conversation to the present. Our communication system is the same as in most other underground struggles. Wherever we may be, wherever other leaders may be, we are always able to make contact somehow. I later learned of Dana Singh's peripheralization in movement politics, and in retrospect thought I detected a hint of sadness, in this last part of the conversation. Do you have a problem with some people getting out of control and doing things they shouldn't do? The Indian government has criminalized the movement. A Sikh who is a devout Sikh, who has taken up armed struggle to uphold the value of Sikh Dharm, will never think of doing anything wrong. So most of the time, these criminal elements are encouraged by the government, or are even government infiltrators. They try to come inside and destroy the movement. What do you think Khalistan will be like? This was the first time in the conversation that I smiled at Dana Singh, and he smiled back readily. What I enshrine in my soul along with most of the Sikhs, is a Khalistan that is an ideal state which the world has not seen before. A place where without distinction of caste, color, or creed, all the citizens will have equality. Everybody will have the right to worship as they please. Citizens of Khalistan will be prosperous, and we will contribute toward the promotion of world peace. We will see that the whole world becomes a just place to live for the people of the Lord. It may have been formulaic, but Bidana Singh clearly felt the validity of this vision deeply. I tried to pursue the less savory side. Are you afraid that after Khalistan is established, it will be difficult to make that transition? Can we expect that some people, who have gone through so much trouble in their lives, might want to take revenge, that there might be bloodshed? We don't have any malice or animosity toward the common Hindu or toward anybody. Of course there is no question, that some Sikhs will take revenge on the Hindus or other innocent people, but the people who have committed heinous crimes on the Sikhs, will be punished not on the street, but according to the law of the land. They will be tried in the courts of Khalistan, and after their guilt is proved, they will be punished according to the law. 
like war criminals. Yes, yes. We will be punishing them for their misdeeds, not harboring any ill will against them personally. Too much to be hoped for, in a continent known for mob violence, but an admirable sentiment. But will other Hindus be able to worship freely in Khalistan? Yes, Hindus will have the same rights. As we have proved during the reign of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, when Hindus and Muslims lived along with the Sikhs without any fear. This was again a common point, not entirely without justification, but problematic. Will there be academic freedom in the universities? I brought up a topic dear to my scholar's heart. The Sikhs are basically broad-minded people. We will love to see Khalistan prosper academically, not only research in your field, but in any scientific or humanistic field. There will be no bondage, no bar on any kind of research, and we will welcome this research. Guru Nanak's message is based on love, equality, and justice, and as Sikhs we won't be great if we don't live up to this love, equality, and justice. It's our moral duty. We can't be close-minded people. We will have to hear the viewpoints of others, and I hope you will continue your research and writing after Khalistan is established as well as now. Are the Khalistanis in solidarity with the people of Kashmir? I queried. It's not only Kashmir, though for the Kashmiris we have great love and awe, but you know that even the hymn of Guru Nanak says that all people are equal and deserve our love. None should be alien. So being bound by Guru's word, we sympathize not only with the Kashmiris, but with all the justice-loving peoples of the world. We should all help in the liberation movements of the world. Do you think your life is in danger now? No, I don't fear any danger. All is in the hands of Almighty God, and it is the way of the Sikh that if martyrdom comes, it should come in pursuit of truth. If the time comes and the Guru asks me, I will happily be martyred for the cause. Look, to die is not our only ambition. If our goal can be achieved in any other way we should do it. But if our cause demands martyrdom, we won't hesitate. That was the conclusion of my conversation with Vaidana Singh. I asked him whether I could use his name outright in my book, since his membership in the original Panthic Committee, would make him identifiable by any interested party. He said yes, and I promised to transcribe the interview in full, without editing his words. and flew along without time to consider much what to say. Great is God, victory belongs to God. He began with the ritual greeting of the Khalsa Sikhs. Not sure where to start, I asked my usual introductory questions about family and background. I come from district Jalandhar, and the name of my village is Karar Majur. Here I was born and finished high school. After that for about a year I stayed home and worked in the fields. Of the four of us brothers, one is now in Canada, and the other two are still working on our family farm. As for me, after I worked in the fields for a while, I decided to go for a career in electric welding. But then the episode of 1978 happened, when the Narankaris attacked the Sikhs, and that was like a shock to my mind. Then I didn't feel like working in any field other than toward my faith. After that I was baptized into the Khalsa. Could you explain to me what is the process of being baptized? I asked. It was not really the point of what I wanted to know from Dana Singh, but it was an easy question for an anthropologist to fall back on. By Dana Singh looked slightly bemused by my question, but he explained patiently. In the morning on which a Sikh is to be baptized. Dana Singh it was a warm summer day in the community kitchen of the Gurudwara, and women were bustling about cleaning dishes, while a few stragglers finished their lunch. The sound of curtain from the hall of worship upstairs, was filtered blurrily into the room through an inadequate intercom, and the noise from a distant vacuum cleaner added to the cacophony. I was hot and tired after a series of problematic discussions. But Rajwinder, a Sikh with whom I was staying for a few days, wanted me to meet one more person. 
we were sitting cross-legged in one corner of the large hall, when a particularly gentle-looking man came and sat down with us, surrounded by a dense coterie of others. Some of them sat down with us and others remained standing, watching. Here is Bhidana Singh, said Rajwinder. I looked at him questioningly. Was this the Dana Singh who was a member of the original Panthic Committee, which declared the independence of Khalistan in 1986? Rajwinder understood my wordless question and nodded slightly. Unprepared, I stammered out some phrases about how pleased I was to meet him, thinking as I spoke what questions I most urgently wanted to ask Dana Singh. But the conversationized, he is to bathe completely, including washing of his hair. And then he has to have the five articles of faith on his body when he comes to the place where the baptism is to happen. Baptism is done in the presence of the Guru Granth Sahib, and in the presence of five beloved ones, the Panch Piaras, who are already there. All of them are wearing the five articles of faith. There we express our desire, standing before those five beloved ones, to be baptized. Then we are asked about certain principles and commitments which a Sikh has to have to be baptized. Those commitments have to be met, even if it comes to sacrificing 